Did you believe it? Well, when people who don't know one another keep telling the same story over and over again, even if you're skeptical, you have to accept the fact that, you know, it's a commonly told story. And when people began to go further and tell me things that I found later being validated in, in documents, then you can't deny it. You know, as a minister, you, lean, you learn to uh, detect bullshit pretty quickly in people. And you can tell in somebody's eyes when, they, when they're suffering, and it's incredibly painful for them to tell a story. They're not making this stuff up. Uh, to come in, and that's what happened in the summer of 1998 in Vancouver. I organized a lot of the survivors to come and give testimony at this. And at that tribunal, um, anything you could ever imagine that went on in a Nazi death camp was described. There was a group of people from the Cooper Island Catholic School who described being uh, part of a medical experiment in 1939 when German-speaking doctors were injecting them in their chests with these chemicals that was killing them. I'm 100% sure that we're used as guinea pigs in these local hospitals for some unknown reason. We were, we were lugged off the hospital, I can remember that. And I know it wasn't for dentistry, I know I wasn't sick. I read Kevin Annette's document starting about six months ago, and it helped me understand how come my memory <clears throat> wasn't, was so vague. In reading parts of it, they talked about shock treatment. In my last year there, the spring of, the, of 1961, I was taken from the school to Charles Campbell Indian Hospital, and from Charles Campbell Indian Hospital to Panoka Mental Institute. <clears throat> I don't know if I was there a week or two weeks, but I have vague memories of it, but the, the memory that flashed back for me is laying on this table and stuff in my head and then these flashing lights just continually. They had put needles in my head and had hooked them up electrically and would zap me. At that time my arms were put in a chair and locked in so I couldn't move and my head was put on a, a brace in the back so I could not, I was like this, I couldn't move and um, I can't tell you how long they had done it. All I remember is that I still, to this day, I still get a, you know, like my brain will still have that kind of a kick from it, right? Right. And um, they had done a lot of, a lot of bad things by um, putting medications in the food while I was in the dark room, bringing the food in, and you had to eat it, and if you didn't eat it, then if you threw it up into a bag, they put it on the plate again and make you eat it. Did they put you in a hospital? Yes, I did. Well, they uh, gave me some drugs or something like that. What kind, what happened I to you? I don't know what kind of drug it was. What happened to you when they gave you the drugs? Hey, oh, they uh, put me in there, like a padded room. Padded room, like? Oh, uh, I'll strap down. That was after you reported the girl? Yeah. Finding the girl's body? Yeah. Historically, it was interesting how everything was coinciding because as I got thrown out of the church, um, the first lawsuits were being brought against the church and the government by the survivors of residential schools. This would have been in early 1996. And right at the same time, kind of like the attitude was, well, you know, you got tossed out of the church. You must have done something right, kind of from the, from the point of view of Native people. And they began to, you know, my, the trust level went way up because I wasn't part of that institution anymore. And I was being invited down to these healing circles in the downtown east side of Vancouver to listen to people's stories. And then eventually they began to ask me to record them for them. And that's when I began to seriously document a lot of these stories that went... Up until that point you had not documented anything that was said at well, the Well, I hadn't systematically gone about it. I had, you know, written down notes and that, that people had shared with me. But it was clear from the things they were sharing that this went far beyond the physical and sexual abuses that are talked about in the in the press. Well, they're not talked much anymore about, but for a while they were. The, you know, people were describing children being sterilized, uh, being murdered, being used in medical experiments, being deliberately exposed to tuberculosis and then left to die. They realized, and I realized with them, that all we were doing is sitting around hearing everybody's sad stories and it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, the people were not recovering from this. There were a lot of lawyers and native politicians making money off their pain, 
but they weren't changing anything in their life. I'd know people who'd tell their story and then go kill themselves. Well, was there um, a design to heal people, or was there just a design to no. have people talk? Healing is a is a word from the dominant society. It's a way for people to make money off other people. People don't heal from this. That's the reality. The first thing to realize is that I'm never going to get over this because it's not only so traumatic, but it's so systematic in the culture. You can't heal as a native person. The whole society is arranged against you. What you can do is to tell the truth. And I realized that about myself. I was never going to recover from this. I'm never going to be allowed into the academic world. I'm not going to be allowed to have a job anywhere. Who's going to listen? You know, who's going to stand up? You know, in the court case in this country of ours, you know, minimum we need is 80,000 bucks to 800,000 bucks to start a court case. And how many lawyers in this country of ours that's going to stand up and fight for our just rights? There ain't any. And how many uh, Indian lawyers we got have yet seen one to step up to the plate to take the fight all the way? Oh, I hate doing this.